to see everybody that's here. We have a lot of sickness in our group and uh, a lot of people suffering colds and taking care of others who are not feeling well and so we need to keep them in our prayers. And we also need to be reminded that we need to keep praying for ourselves because if we're going to be caregivers we need to be taking care of people and, and doing what we can. And so we're, we're glad to see those who are here and some are probably watching us on the internet right now so we're, we're glad to have you join us and as always if you have any questions about what you hear or what we we talk about uh, you, you always have the ability to get on your Facebook and send us a message and and ask us a question we'll be glad to uh, entertain any questions that come our way I mean truth has nothing to hide so we'll be glad to talk about the truth and what the Bible says when we start when you when you want opinions of men, I mean, we're not going to do that. We're going to give you Bible for what we do and, and say. So we're going to be re reminded of this. Now, one thing we always need to do is remember to keep God close to us. So keep God close to you. And we must learn to let God be in control of our life. Because too often we turn that control over to somebody else or as Avery likes to say, someone who influences us to do Amen. something that we, we're not supposed to be doing. Amen. And so, we place this on the passage in Psalm 73 and verse 28. It says, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of thy works. I mean, that, this is a whole sermon here, and it's based on this passage. And so, the nearness of God. See, do we really have the confidence to utter such words today? Do I have the confidence to say, the nearness of God is my good? Well, those who are trying to serve God to the best of their ability, yes, they can say that with confidence. They, they don't have to sit back and quit, well, I think so, or it just seems to me, but when we are doing what God tells us to do, then yes, we are keeping God close to us. We're keeping in a good relationship with God. That's how you're close to somebody. You're in a relationship with them. And if your relationship is separated by a great distance, I mean, you can't really claim to be near God. And if we're trying to live a life other than the one he tells us to live, we cannot be near God. And that's expressed back in verse uh, 27, and we'll mention that uh, in a little while. Uh, we ask, need to ask ourselves, am I, am, am I as near to God as I should be? Now, really, we should all answer this, no, I'm not. I mean, yes, we like to think, yes, I'm in a good relationship with God. I'm doing the Lord's work. I stand up and I preach the gospel. And I'm teaching people and trying to help people get to heaven. And that puts us on the same page as long as I'm preaching what's in the gospel. But if we ever get satisfied with where we are, we fail to grow beyond that. And that's where we all need to be heading. We need to grow better. We need to get closer to God. And you might question, well, how can I get closer to God? I'm already as close as I can be. There's always room for improvement. And it doesn't matter how good you are. There's always room for improvement. Ask any professional sports team who's won their, the, the championship. Is there room for improvement? You better believe it. And they know it. And the ones that know it actually strive for that perfection. They strive to get better. And they, they have the possibility of repeating their championship season. And so, yes, we, we can say confidently, yes, I am near to God because I'm doing what he wants me to do and my heart is geared towards serving him. But yet, there's always room for improvement. And that's how we look at it. And we all need to answer this simple question in the affirmative. Yes, I am near to God. And how do I know that? Well, we look at the evidence. The evidence suggests I'm trying to do what God tells me to do. And that makes sure that I am near to God. 
Now, as we said last week in our sermon, a lot of people, well, it just seems to me, or I feel in my heart, I'm near to God. And we, we pointed out back then, just because you're saying that doesn't make it so. We need the evidence to support that. And that evidence comes from how we live and how we behave and how we think and our attitudes behind that. So here's the key that we're looking for. We cannot keep God close to us unless we are working to keep close to God. I mean, that's that just that simple. We've got to be working towards keeping close to God. And he's not going to be there if we're not. See, oftentimes we read or hear of people confidently asserting that they are in control of their own life. I'm sure you've heard many people say that. Well, I'm in control of my life, but is anybody really in control of their life? And should they be in control of their own life? That's what we need to wonder. Most people claim they are, but in reality, they are not in control. They cannot uh, change anything, and there's many factors in, to determine if you're in control of yourself or, or someone else even. And a lot of people like to run the show and, and be in control of others. And people in politics, they like that power that they have to tell people what to do and how to live, how, many pax, how much taxes they have to pay, and all sorts of things dealing with power. And there's many factors that we have. We'd like to think that, well, we're a free spirit, we can do what we want, but then God points us out in the right direction. Hey, you better be doing what I tell you to do. That automatically means that we're not in control of ourselves. And, and so some might say that they are in control of other lives. And yes, in some respects, that's very true. I mean, when you think about it, there's certain people that are in control of other lives. And we'll mention some of those in a little bit. See, we are responsible for our own actions and our thoughts. And that's true. We're going to be held accountable for what we do. We're going to be uh, accountable for what's in our hearts and what we say. And we are accountable to God for the rules that he has given us to live by. See, all of a sudden that tells everybody, I'm not in control of my life. God should be in control of my life. And the scriptures tell us if we keep God near to us, it is for our good if we trust in the Lord with our whole heart and lean not on our own understanding, and that is good. And, and so he's given us these rules. And some people look at that in a negative sense. Well, I can't have any fun. He won't let me have any fun. And, of course, that's the wrong attitude to have. And so if we care about our soul, we will learn those rules and abide by them. We will learn what God expects of us, and we will do our best to live that way. We will do our best to share that message with others and show them the right way to live. Why? So that they can also enjoy the beauty of heaven. I mean, that's what we're looking for. We want to go to heaven, but if we don't share this information... We're not going to make it there. And so, if we do not care about our soul, we're just going to do what we want. And we're gonna, not going to like that some people want to direct us and tell us how to live our lives. Are we in control? When you're driving to work and you, you come up to an intersection and the light turns red, are you in control of your life? Are you in control? That light is telling you what to do. Now, you, you have to reason, okay, now if I just ignore that, just go on through, I could get killed in an accident. I could kill somebody else in an accident. So guess what? I'm going to stop because there's a stop sign or, or a stoplight, and I'm going to take care of myself, and as a result, it should help those around me be safe. I mean, so I'm not in control. That stoplight is in control. And when we get to work, are we in control of what we do? Do we get to do whatever we want to do when we get to work? Maybe the CEO, maybe the president gets to do that. But guess what? Everybody else has got to follow the rules. And what happens if they don't follow the rules? <laughs> They're going to lose their job. So, I mean, that, that's it. Sometimes we voluntarily 
allow others to control our lives. We put ourselves into others. And we could say this, well, if we become servants of others as we're supposed to be, yes, we are letting others dictate how we live. And that should not be a problem because we are to serve them. I mean, we're not serving ourselves, we're serving someone else, and that's what God wants us to do. And perhaps we, we have others control our lives because of something we did. Let's take the criminal. You get sent off to prison, guess what? There's rules in those prisons. There's rules in there. And if you don't abide by the rules, you're going to get punished. And so some people have no choice in the matter. Yeah, I can't go down to McDonald's whenever I want to if I'm in prison. And it's just not going to happen. And because there's rules. I can't walk out the gates whenever I want to. And people who want to think, well, I'm in control of my own life, let them try and walk out the gate and see what happens. I mean, it, it's just that way. And we, we decide, okay, we, we start working 30 minutes in our shift. I'm hungry. I'm going to go get a... Uh, uh, a, a McDonald's sandwich, breakfast sandwich, and I'll be back in a little while. How do you think the boss is going to take that? <laughs> no, it's going to be frowned upon. Uh-uh, don't do that. And, and so, sometimes we have no choice in the matter. And, and we still, we learn very quickly that we either comply with the rules or we get punished. And we started learning that as we, from ch childhood. We started learning that. I mean, we don't remember those times, I'm sure. I mean, parents remember how they brought up their children. The child, only two or three years old, would be grabbing something. We say, no, no. And guess what? It doesn't take long before that child realizes, I better not be touching that. Especially if there's consequences. And, and Ray's brought this up before because there's pain associated with it. Doing something they shouldn't be doing, there's pain associated with that. And that is a learning process. And so we learn. We either comply with the rules or we get punished. We either observe the stoplight, the stop sign, or we're paying a fine. And if we pay a lot of those fines, and guess what? They're going to take our privileges away. They're going to take our rights away. And we, there's rules in the workplace. There's rules in the home. There's rules in society at large that we need to follow and abide by. I mean, if we're, if we're out there getting a job, we've got to pay taxes. And we should be paying taxes. And, and so uh, that, that's the way things are. And so when you agreed, like I said, to work for a business, you're going to allow the boss or supervisor to direct your actions and, and what you do. You get in there. He says, pick up that broom and start sweeping. Well, guess what? If you want to keep your job, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the break room. You're going to sit down and drink a cup of coffee. No, you're not. You're going to grab that broom. You're going to start sweeping. And if the boss says, go clean the restroom, you're going to go clean the restroom. If the boss says, you go do this or that, guess what you're going to do? Are you in control of yourself? No. You are voluntarily allowing them to control you. Why? Because I want that job. I need to make the money. And, and so that's what we do. And we also learn here that if you refuse to follow the orders of the commands, you could lose your job. And guess what? You can't buy your children the Christmas gifts or anything like that. And, and so, and you can't pay your bills and you probably won't have a house very long. But if you refuse to follow the rules or... In the scriptures, if we refuse to follow the commands of God, he's going to remove our part from him. That's why we need to be close to him. And so when we would, then we will seek employment elsewhere, and guess what? The same scenario is going to be in place. Some other boss is going to be telling you what to do. And so we just have to accept that. And we either follow the rules, guidelines, or instructions, or lose our job. That's why a lot of people just go from job to job to job. They just don't want to do what the boss tells them to do. That's why a lot of people go from church to church to church. Because they don't like what the preacher's telling them how to live and how to behave and how to talk and things like that. 
So they, they keep doing that, and they're going to lose their place in their relationship with God. See, this we learn in the home from a young age. Like I said a little while ago, our parents are charged with the responsibility to train up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. And that's what we're supposed to be doing as parents should be teaching them. Now, they, they are to train us, and if we do not comply, we might get punished. And that's true. But sadly, in our age, many parents do not train their children in the ways of the Lord, and our society demonstrates such. You see how people treat each other out there. And these people do not have an inkling of who God is and what God expects of us, and they don't know the difference between right and wrong. And then we wonder, well, why do we have so much crime out there? You know, that's been happening for years. Cities get out there, people running wild, doing whatever they want to do, and people wonder, well, why, why do we have so much crime? Well, we have crime because people don't have God in their life. And, and so if we have God in our life, we're going to be living the way God wants us to live, and we're not going to be the ones going out there and committing vandalism. We're not going to be ones out there rioting. We're not going to be demonstrating and tearing things up. I mean, we might be able to demonstrate and speak out and voice our opinion about certain issues, but we're not going to do so with violence. I mean, we, and we should not do so with violence. See, a lot of people have attitude and anger and intolerance issues. We know that. We see it every day. I mean, for these, they allow others to get under their skin and irritate them so much that they might actually hurt someone else. I mean, let, let's face it. We, we see that. I mean, the term road rage is a term that developed in the last, well, I say 20 years, probably about the last 30 years. We hear about that. Someone cuts them off. They get mad. They'll either pull out a gun and start shooting or they'll ram their vehicle. They get so mad, so incensed. And a lot of people have died because of road rage. Because the driver didn't like what, what, they, what they did. I mean, you might be sitting there and give someone your one finger salute and then they'll turn around and shoot your window out with a gun. They might even shoot you. And, and so, road rage is something, but what it, all it is is you're letting that person get under your skin and control your actions. You're not in control when you allow that to happen. See, you look at someone. If they don't like the way you look at them, they just might pound you. They might beat you up. They might shoot you. And yeah, some people say they used to live that way. And others still live that way. If they don't like the way you look at them, <laughs> you're going to do what you want to do. See, it is our fear of these kind of people that we have given them control over our lives because we live in fear. I mean, we don't know what a person is going to be doing out there. We don't know if they're going to have these road rage issues or these anger management issues. And so we tread lightly. We speak softly and gently, hoping that we don't offend anybody, which these days is very hard to do, isn't it? I mean, every time you turn around, you can say, well, I believe in God. You've just offended a lot of people by saying that. I believe in traditional marriage. You've offended a lot of people. They call you a bigot and all sorts of things like that. And, and so, I mean, we, we do fear these people. And we, we walk gently. And sometimes we are smart enough to avoid these type of people. And these toxic people we don't need in our lives. And yet, they are controlling our actions and our thoughts. See, now as Christians, we view control differently than the world does. See, we are spiritually minded and realize that our God must be in control of our lives. And that's the difference between a faithful Christian and a person of this world. They don't they don't think God should be in control of their lives. They think they're in control of their own lives. But as Christians, God's got to be in control. And that's why we need to stay close to him. See, God has always been upset with people who would not follow the direction he has set for them. And we have 
We have a book full of examples of people who would not listen to God or be controlled by God. Yes, it is called the Bible. And we see that. We see when those who did what God wanted them to do are blessed. And we see those who did not do what God wanted them to do are cursed and punished. We, we learn these. We, we su we're supposed to learn from these examples. Uh, Romans 15, 4, we're supposed to learn from them. 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 11, don't follow the example that they set because they did wrong. And so, uh, yes, we have examples of people who would not listen to God and they were punished. Now, we also supposed to learn from that and take away from that if we don't follow God's rules and instructions, we're going to be punished. Amen. So, I mean, it, it's, it's not hard to figure out, folks. But when we go back to our text, why would we not want to be near God? Remember it says, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. Why would you not want to be near God? Well, we have several quotations in Scripture that we are to draw near to God. Draw near means come close. Bring it closer to me. Get it to where I can get it. That word draw is basically, if you remember many years ago, people would go out to the well and they'd drop a bucket in there and draw the water up to them. They're bringing the water close to them. Why? So they can access it. So they can get a hold of it. So they can use it for cooking or for drinking, uh, cleaning or whatever. But they had to draw it near to them. And so we have the scriptures of drawing near to God. You know, Hebrews 10, 22. We are to draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Yes, faith is important, like we talked about this morning. Faith is necessary, but if faith alone is not going to cut it. Faith is necessary, and we draw near to God. In James 4, 8, draw near to God, and he will draw nigh unto you. See, God wants to be near us just as much as we should want to be near God. And if we make the effort to draw near to God, he's automatically going to come closer to us. And that's what, just what the scripture says here. And so there are several psalms that speak of the nearness of God, keeping God close, the blessing of being in the presence of God, and the blessings of living the way God wants us to live as we, as we are obedient. And we learn and realize that he is in our midst. You know, Isaiah chapter 12, he uses that phrase, our God is in our midst. And so, I mean, he was speaking for the nation of Israel, our God is in our midst. We should be honoring him. But the people were not doing that. And Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, I'm there in their midst and with them. And so God is in our midst. Every time we come together as a church, God is here. But whenever we are anywhere, God is near. He's near enough to see us. He's good near enough to hear us. He's near, He's close enough and inside of us enough to know what we're thinking. And that should be very humbling for us to accept. God knows everything I'm thinking and doing. Yeah, there's a lot of times we, we, we think something, but we don't come out and say it. And you say, okay, that's wisdom in practice. And that's true. But uh, there's other times we start thinking something, God, no, 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 no. You shouldn't be doing that. And we need to get to that point where we realize we should not be doing that. See, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, Moses told the people God's commands are near. They're not far off. They're not so far off that you have to travel miles to find out what God wants you to do. I mean, it's there. It's available. And we all have that nowadays. We have our Bibles. This is the nearness of God. We have his word right in our hands, and we hold his word in our hands. And this word is everything we need. So we just need to open this book, read this book, and apply this book to our lives. And that's what we need to do. God's not far off. I mean, he, he's not far off. He's not so far that he cannot hear. Isaiah 59 and verse 1 says that. 
But uh, anyway, God's not far off, and his commandments are not far off. They're available to us. And some people have the courage to repeat those commands. And they're, they're, sometimes they're called preachers, sometimes they're just called faithful Christians. But what happens when people repeat those commands, people hate them. Why? Because they hate Jesus. They hate God. And because they don't like someone telling them how to live or what to do. And so, we're told if we will seek first God and his righteousness, or his commandments, God will take care of us. Matthew 6, tells us that. And so, if we will do what God wants us to do, it's going to be for our good. It will, we will have blessings that we really can't even imagine. We sing the song, Count Your Blessings. Name them one by one. Guess what? You're going to fall asleep before you get through naming your blessings. Amen. There's so many of them. And, of course, if we're spiritually minded, we recognize our blessings. But if we're not spiritually minded, I mean, they're, they're, they're just nothing more than burdens that God places upon us. And so, he says that his commandments are not burdensome. See, no one can escape from God. We had that lesson from Psalm 139. Where can I go to get away from the presence of God? Highest mountain, deepest sea? No, God is there. And we cannot escape from God. God is close by. He's paying attention to what we're doing. And he's close enough that if we say, Lord, save me, he's going to reach out and save us. I mean, we're that close. And so we would do that. But why would we not want God near? Well, when you think about that, there is a reason some people don't want God near. And that is because, an obvious reason, because they would see, he would see our sins as we commit them. You remember what it said there in John? Uh, it speaks of men loving the darkness so they can do their evil deeds in stealth. John 3, 19 and 20. But all are just fooling themselves to think that God does not see them. The eyes of the Lord go throughout the earth, seeing what the affairs of men are. And he's watching you and me all the time. And so he's not that far off that he cannot see. When you think of God, how far off does he have to be? I mean, he could be on the other side of the universe, which is billions and billions of miles away, and still know exactly everything you're doing. Because why? Because God is there. God is here. Like that sign says, don't fear tomorrow, God will be there. God is always there. So we just have to recognize that. See, if God is to be our refuge, it is wise to keep him near us. And that, that's right. It's not nice to be there. I mean, if, our, if your refuge, your castle, your security blanket is not in the immediate vicinity, what good is it? I mean, many years ago, people would go out and they would leave the castle and they, they would go out in the forge in the woods looking for stuff. And if the enemy came up, guess what? Their security is way back at that castle. They may not make it back. They may not be secure. And they're in trouble. And yeah, some people, I mean... You know, my ex-wife, she, uh, she used to babysit a lot of kids. And some of them, some of them had a security blanket. Some of them had a, a particular uh, stuffed animal. And if we tried to go anywhere without that stuffed animal, we'd, we'd hear about it. We'd hear the screaming and the crying. We'd have to turn around sometimes and go back, back and pick up a little kitty. I mean, that, that's what she wanted. And, and one time she left at the restaurant, whoa. We didn't get very far out that restaurant. Miss Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. And, oh boy, we had to go back and get Kitty. But that's their security. And she was 18 years old. She, was, she still had little Kitty. And so, but anyway, <coughs> if it's not the immediate vicinity, what good is it? God is our refuge. If we don't have God close to us, what good is that going to do for us? I mean, with God near to us, we are reminded of the necessity to be on our best behavior. And that's right. I mean, when, when, it is usually when we forget God is near that we become naughty and do things we should not do. 
And everybody will acknowledge, yeah, that's true. If you're not thinking about God, your, your mind is on your own selfish thoughts, then you might be doing some things that God wouldn't like, and you forget that. But, but God is watching. Oh, I better take back and uh, step back and uh, start doing things right. And so we need to be reminded that God is near to us, and he wants to be near to us. See, we also need to keep God in our minds and remember his strength to protect our souls. God has the ability to do that. No one else does. And so that's why we need to keep God in our minds. And when we have God in our minds, he is close to us. I mean, how much closer can you get than inside? I mean, think about that. And, and so his strength is there to protect us. And so he is our refuge, as we read. And God may choose not to stop a speeding bullet, but he will stop Satan from taking your soul. Yeah, that, that's true. Sometimes we get caught in the crossfire. And sometimes we're, there's accidents and you know, there's a speeding car and they don't, don't stop. We may die. But our soul is still protected when we have God near to us. It's when we don't have God near to us, then we're in trouble. As long as we are near to God, we are under his protection. And we know that. And with God near us, we feel obligated to make him proud of us. And we hope he pays attention, which he does, and offers us a final eternal reward. I mean, that's what we're looking for. I mean, we, we, he, he's told us about this place called heaven. And God, if I will do what you ask me to do, you promised that place to me. And I'm looking forward to that. And that's what we want. And we hope he's paying attention. And yes, Hebrews 8, 6 tells, yeah, God, God doesn't forget. He's going to pay attention to that. See, think of the words we use to describe the attributes of God and what he does for us. I mean, just some of the words are stronghold, fortress, shield, deliverer, rock, a very present help in time of trouble, Redeemer, refuge, strength, salvation, all of these. And yes, there are many more descriptions of God that speak of his care and his protection. Why would we not want that? Because we only have that if we're near to him. If we separate ourselves from God, I mean, let's face it, who would not want to be near a God like this? Well, <laughs> that's kind of a moot point. People in this room probably understand this question a whole lot better than the people outside of this room. And I'm not talking about those who aren't here because they're sick. I'm talking about the world out there. They don't recognize what God has the potential to be for them as well. That's why we have a responsibility to go and teach them about God. And that's why in our text, in, in Psalm uh, 73 and verse 28, the last line is that I may tell of all thy works. I mean, this is a, another reason. We keep God close to us. He is our refuge, and what are we going to do about it? We're going to share that with others. That's what we're supposed to do. See, another thing we should consider, and with such confidence and the joy that accommodates this feeling, why are we not telling others about it? I mean, that's a, that's a valid question, and uh, if we really feel blessed, and we really know that God wants us to share the message of salvation with others, why would we withhold such glad tidings from others? I mean, that, that gets, once again, that speaks to our responsibility called personal evangelism. I mean, yeah, we come into this place, we talk about this, and everybody gives the amen, and oh yeah, that's, that's the way it is, but folks... If we don't take this message out those doors and share it with our neighbors and our families and our friends and our co-workers and our classmates, what good is it going to do us? Right. Nothing at all. See, we read many times in the scripture that some people did not want to hear from God or his prophets. And we know that's very true. And basically, the main reason is because they dwelt in the stubbornness of their own heart. In fact, in other words, they did exactly what they wanted to do and they did not want to be controlled by God 
or anyone else. And in, in one of my discussions with some person, I was trying to talk to him about serving God. He says, I'm not going to allow any God to tell me how to live. I mean, when they, when they make that statement, there's nothing I can do for you. I can't help you. And I just walked away. I had to. Because there's nothing I could say or do that would change him if he wasn't going to submit to God. And so that's what it is. And the people were stubborn in their hearts. In our text, in Psalm 73 and verse 28, it's where we are. But if you go back and read verse 27, notice what it says. For behold, those who are far from thee will perish. Thou hast destroyed all those who are unfaithful to thee. I mean, that bites. That hurts. That's strong words. And then it leads us into the nearness of God is our good. And so, we read several times in Scripture that the people were stubborn in the hearts and would not listen to God so as to be saved. All right, see, there's nothing new under the sun, and that attitude exists today in the hearts of many. Now, we may not persuade men or women to turn to the Lord, but we should be able to express our own faith. You realize that? A lot of people, they don't want to hear it, but we should be willing to express our faith. You know, some people do so publicly. Yeah, they get, they get called all sorts of names, but we should be willing to express our faith. At least I believe in God, and I believe in serving God to the best of my ability, and I believe that when I serve God, he pays attention, and he's going to bless me, and we should at least be able to do that. We should have no problem telling our brethren what the Lord has done for us. We're supposed to do that. And, and Psalm 22, verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my breth brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. I mean, we're supposed to do that. Several times in the psalm says, I will tell of what the Lord has done for me. And why do we do it in the assembly? Because we all have the same mindset. We all want to be here pleasing God. And what that does is gives us the confidence to not only share it with our brethren, but to go out into the world and share it with them as well. And so, such should prepare us to tell our friends who are not Christians what the benefits are of serving the Lord God of heaven. That's why we need to talk about it. A lot of people don't even try and teach others because they don't think they have the, the knowledge of the Bible to share the message. Well, I say, you better learn it. You better learn the Bible and then start sharing the message. Because, folks, you can go to church for 40, 50 years. If you don't share the message of God, you're not going to heaven. I truly believe that. I mean, we, we should do that. Maybe there's exceptions to that statement, but uh, I, they'd be very rare, if anything. See, we should be looking towards our reward and be willing to warn those who are lost of the eternal consequences of not serving God. I mean, we, we should warn them. And yes, sadly, many in our society do not recognize even the existence of God. And those that do choose not to honor Him, as we read there in Romans 1.21. They saw fit not to honor God as God. And, and, and so... May we all have an appreciation for the presence of God and determine to keep him near our hearts and minds and rely upon him as our protection and tell others about how great and awesome our God really is. So it's just that easy to know. All right, we're going to sing an invitation song. If anyone does need to respond, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.